Um, this is part three in the series of webinars that we've been doing every Friday. Today, we're going to talk about the culture and non-clinical skills that you need for optimal collaboration with your UK colleagues. So if we can have the next slide, please. In part one and part two, uh, some questions have arisen and Dr. Adnan kindly forwarded did these questions and comments to me. So I thought I would just summarize them first. Um, and those of you who are listening, if any questions or comments arise, peel, please feel free to ask. So um, one of the questions was, can I start collecting work-based assessments now while I'm in Pakistan? Now, yes, you can. You can download them, but there's a very important point I need to highlight here. The workplace-based assessments that you do in Pakistan, you can't use those for your CESA application. If when you come to the UK and you want to do training, um, you, want to, you want to demonstrate that you have the same equivalent competencies as an ophthalmology trainee who's in a recognized national training program, that those workplace based assessments have to be done within the NHS setting. They can be done in private hospitals within the UK if your clinical supervisor is uh, somebody who is familiar with the Royal College of Ophthalmology curriculum. And to show those credentials, that person needs to ideally be a fellow of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists and have done the training, the trainers course. So when they're assessing you on your work-based assessment, they're using the standards of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. So colleagues in Pakistan, if they are um, not affiliated to the RC Ops, then how can the RC Ops look at the evidence in the CESA format? However, it is very useful to start collecting workplace-based assessments because if you want to come to England and apply for a, a job here, if you've started a portfolio by collecting work-based assessments in Pakistan, that shows you understand how to um, get workplace-based assessments done, that you've got personal organization skills, that you can plan ahead. It shows many, many skills, which makes it a useful thing to do. Um, so you can download the forms to the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, and then you can scan them into your electronic portfolio or make a paper recording code. in progress. OK, can they be used as evidence to submit as part of a CESA application? Unfortunately, not because of the reason that I've said. Also, the time is very critical. So this comment keeps coming up too. I have done um, competencies and I have collected evidence or I did a research paper. It's seven years old, it's six years old. It has to be within five years of submitting the evidence for it to be counted. Okay, and the reason for that is because they wanna look at the competencies and they want to see evidence that these are uh, you've achieved them and you've maintained them. So if you provide evidence that's seven years old or eight years old or nine years old, yes, you achieved them back then, but what's the evidence that you've maintained them and what they've decreed to be a reasonable time frame is within five years that that, that competency will be maintained. So, so why should I bother doing workplace-based assessments? Mrs. Khan did a webinar and she said, oh, you can start now when you're in Pakistan. Why did she say that to us? Because when you do job applications, when you come to the UK, you will have things you can talk about in your interview. You will have skills you can demonstrate, such as personal organization, understanding of clinical governance and evidence for clinical governance, research, audit, uh, sticking to guidelines, using evidence-based medicine, using procedures that keep patients safe, um, you, uh, contributing to quality improvement work. So that's the reason. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Can all my workplace-based assessments be signed by one clinical supervisor? Because my job in, in Pakistan might be that I only have one senior that I can go to to sign, Is will that be acceptable? So the answer to that question is, the expectation in the UK is that they should be spread across many professional colleagues, many senior 
it would be a sign of concern if only one colleague was signing all of the workplace-based assessments. Of course, it's understandable if you, for six months, you're working and you only have one consultant that you can go to, but that it's just something to be aware of that it's the golden uh, standard is to get multiple people that are, then you've got more voices saying this trainee, this doctor is competent in this skill. And then you've got another professional colleague saying, yes, I've seen this doctor doing that. The more people that can attest, the stronger the value of the evidence. If it's just one person, it's a bit of a concern then. And also, we also, on the same uh, uh, topic, if a trainee has gets all of their workplace-based assessments done in one week and the date on them shows that these have been bunched together, that's a cause for concern because what they like to see in portfolio is a gradual accumulation of evidence that even shows evidence of getting better at doing something. So your first one that you did at the beginning of your job, it might not be very good. The feedback could be there saying, look, you need more practice. Don't despair. You know, that's still very useful to put in your portfolio because, you know, what they love is evidence of progression and evidence of improvement. So in three months time, if you then repeat that same workplace based assessment and it shows how much you've improved, that is like really good quality evidence for a portfolio. So never think I'm going to throw this one away because it's not very good. And all my portfolio is full of excellent, excellent, full marks, very good. You know, we want, they want, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists would like to see evidence of progress. I know it's very hard for trainees to take a piece of evidence that doesn't give them full marks and keep it and put it in their portfolio. But please remember what I said about evidence of progress. Um, okay. Now, the other question I got was, what if my senior is uh, not the Royal College of Ophthalmologists uh, member, but a member of the FRCS Glasgow or Edinburgh? So um, I th for the purpose of showing that you know how to make a portfolio and that you're starting on that path and you understand how to work within a regulatory process, an educational evidence collecting process, I think it's absolutely fine. It's just for the Caesar. If you want to use that you've got to come to England first and then start collecting the evidence for the Caesar within five years or uh, some sort of NHS recognized facility where there's um, Royal College of Ophthalmology members. I don't think it's uh, possible to collect five years of evidence in Pakistan and then come to the UK, submit it to the college and say, okay, I've done all of my competencies. The college will say, yes, but the the, the setting that you worked in wasn't an NHS setting and also it wasn't a UK setting, but also the people that signed you off, how do we know that they're using the same standards that we have set to say that it's equivalent to national training program in the UK? So I hope that makes sense. Any questions, any comments? Okay, if there's no questions or comments, shall we move on to the next slide? So what are you going to learn in today's webinar? We're going to talk about why culture is important. Um, and there's a very famous uh, advertisement that used to come on TV for the HSBC Bank. And they really emphasize this point in their marketing that we understand culture in different countries. We're an international bank, but we ad adapt the way we do business according to the culture of the country that we're in. And that's a very important reason why, and we're going to go through that. And that's very important for doctors who are working in one healthcare system in one part of the world, and then they move to a different part of the world. They've got to understand the culture if they want to succeed and collaborate well with colleagues there. And I'm going to explain that a bit more. And then the trust triangle. This is a really important piece of information. I came across this when I read the Harvard Business Review for leaders. What makes a good leader? Leaders can cultivate trust. Doctors are in a leadership role often, whether you're leading on the management of your patient, whether you are working in a team and you have to make decisions on behalf of that team. 
So trust is so important. How do you cultivate trust? And there's three aspects, and I'm going to go through that with you. That's the trust triangle, okay? Then we're going to talk about non-clinical skills that you need to be a good ophthalmologist, because we know that as, as a trainee ophthalmologist, we have to acquire the knowledge. We know we need to acquire the practical skills, surgery, laser, et cetera. And we know we need to have the behaviors of professionalism that we need. So what are those non-clinical behaviors as a put, you know, in Clinical is surgical and knowledge-based, skill-based competencies. It's the behavioral aspects that you need to know about. How do you grow and maintain a skill? And what is professionalism? So let's move on to the next slide. This is what we're going to talk about today. So with regard to culture, I don't know, Dr. Adnan, if we can play a short video which shows this advertisement. And I want everybody to listen and to pick out some points about why culture is important and give me examples. Let's see if the video works. Ma'am, we cannot share it uh, while sharing the skin. We can. Uh, okay. But, uh, okay. On the slide, can we share? <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the next slide. I'll explain what's in the video instead. And those of you who are listening, if you're interested, you can always Google the HSBC culture ad. So what they say is don't underestimate the importance of local knowledge. They show a clip where in the USA, uh, they stand up in a meeting because they want to save time and they want to keep people fresh and alert. So they all stand up and they have their morning meeting. But in Japan, it's the opposite. They sit down for their morning meeting because they want to contemplate better. And if you say to the Japanese, stand up and have the meeting, they'll be very offended and they will feel very bad. They will say that that's not the way, you know, we need to think and to think we need to sit down. In America, they'll think better if they're standing up. So in Greece, if you do this to somebody, okay, this could mean stop. But in Greece, this is a big insult. It's insulting. And in Thailand, you know how... Sometimes we sit, if we put our legs up, um, put our feet up on a stool. In Thailand, if you do that and you are showing the soles of your feet as somebody's walking past, that's very, very disrespectful. But in many other cultures, that's just okay. You just put your feet up. You're just relaxing. So knowing this local information of what upsets people, what makes people feel negative, what makes them feel bad, because that's what their rules are in their culture. We have to know what these things are, especially when we move to a different thing. So how is this relevant for somebody who's living and working in Pakistan and they moved to the UK to do some ophthalmology training? Well, in the past, handshakes were an issue. So as Pakistan is predominantly a Muslim country, we sometimes hesitate to shake hands. But having said that, with COVID, now nobody shake hands, so that's good. <laughs> That's worked out really well for everyone. We got rid of that um, awkwardness. Should I shake hands? Shouldn't I shake hands? If somebody puts their hand out to me, I don't want to shake. If I don't want to shake their hand, will I offend them? Will they think I'm not, you know, because that's in their culture. That's a way of showing respect. The other thing is eye contact with a smile. Again, in some cultures, eye contact is, you know, too uh, aggressive. And you look down because you don't, you don't want to be like too overbearing and invade somebody's personal space but in the UK when you speak to somebody by looking at them you're giving them respect neutral warmth in the professional arena in the hospital setting in the eye clinic setting being too friendly is not normal it's not it's not expected but being too reserved, the other side is, again, not accept acceptable. So neutral warmth is how a professional is expected to be. You've got to show some warmth, a little smile, kindness in your eyes, full attention, eye contact. That's neutral warmth, but not overboard like, oh, in Pakistan, for example, when I was visiting, people were very kind. And if I went to an eye clinic, but if I took my relative for an appointment, they would say, oh, would you like some tea or coffee? Very kind, very hospitable. In, in the UK, that would not be expected. It, it would be strange if you did that. 
Um, the other thing is, as an examiner, say you uh, in the future become an examiner and you say to a candidate who walks through the door, oh, you know, hello, um, can I check your name? Can I check your ID badge? And then you just want to put them at ease and you say, oh, where are you from? Now, you might be listening and saying, well, that's very normal. That's very, you know, the examiner is clearly trying to put the candidate at ease. But that is actually not acceptable because of the new equality and diversity rules that we have in place to ensure that there is no discrimination by a professional in a higher position of a professional in a lower position. We are told you must not ask where somebody is from because they may feel that depending on the answer they give, that you might feel more close and give them a better mark or more distant and give them a bad mark. So therefore don't ask that question. So there's you need to know these, these cultural differences. Um, look at all the members, not just the speaker. So if you have a patient who comes into the consulting room, the patient might be very hesitant, they might be unwell, they might not have confidence, and they may have a carer or a relative that comes with them. You're, um, you might feel that it's appropriate to just speak to the person who is speaking for the patient. But because we have patient-centered care in the NHS, it's very important to include the patient in the discussion even if it's just simply looking at them to make them feel included. As the doctor in the consultation, we must never exclude the patient, even if they have asked their relative to advocate for them. At any opportunity, you have to include the patient in the discussion. Any comments or questions arising at this point? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to the next uh, slide, please. I hope I've explained why cultural awareness is important and given you some practical examples as well. So we've covered culture. And if we go to the next slide, we're gonna talk about the trust triangle next. Thank you. Okay, so the trust triangle. Look, this has three points, okay, logic, empathy and authenticity. And coincidentally, these are the first three letters of the word leader. Every leader needs to develop trust within the team that they lead. And how do they do this? By having a logical approach to work, by showing empathy for the people that they work alongside, and by being authentic. So how do you do this? Now, in my coaching workshops, we go into great detail about these how to develop these things but for today's webinar i'm just going to explain the main concept a is for empathy uh, making small talk is so important often we as professionals and doctors are too busy or our mind is too crowded and we don't have time to make small talk let me give you an example from one of my coaching sessions with a junior doctor this junior doctor said to me, I don't feel part of the team. I think they, I, I often, the surgery goes to the fellow. I get left behind. Nobody notices me. I don't feel like I'm part of the team. And we talked about what kind of things um, could happen to, to improve the sense of belonging, which will then lead to more opportunities coming. Because human nature is such that you will notice the people who you feel connected with. How do you develop a connection? It's through developing trust and empathy. So this trainee was feeling on the sideline of the group uh, that she was working with. And I said, okay, what about small talk? Let, let's, um, let's, and she said, I, I can't, I don't, I'm not interested in what they're interested in. Look, I'm my own person. I go home, I have my family, I have my kids. I come to work, I want to work hard at work. I said, yes, that's all right. That's all good. That's all correct. Um, but how do you connect with your colleagues? How do your colleagues know that you care about them as well as care about yourself? Because that is what makes them see you. That is what makes the belonging happen. And that's what leads to the opportunities coming. And she said, oh, I don't know. They When they have 
for example, if they talk about something like what they did at the weekend, well, I've got nothing in common with them. So I just stay quiet. So I said, just do this for me next time. Try, try listening and then making conversation and asking them, what did you do in the weekend? The other thing she shared with me was when they have a team meeting or a you know a dinner, she said, I haven't got time to go for dinners. I'm not interested in socializing with my colleagues, right? I just go to work and then I go home. I said, that's fine. That's good. But when they invite you, what do you do? She said, I just ignore the, the message because they, they're not, they don't care if I go or if I don't go. I said, but if somebody invites you and you don't even reply, how will they feel? And she said, oh, yeah, I didn't think of it like that. And I said, OK, so what could you do differently? And she said, well, I could just reply to say, thank you for inviting me, but I'm busy. I can't make it. I said, yeah, exactly. And then they, they know that, you know, you at least you know, you were there, you, it's about showing up, it's about being present. So if you feel like people aren't seeing you, well, are you actually, what are you doing to improve that situation? What are you doing that's making that situation worse? So this is an example of how we talked about developing empathy and small talk is so important for that. Small talk is about in with your colleagues in, in between theatre cases, getting a cup of coffee and saying, how was your weekend? And then they'll tell you, oh, you know, I was fixing my car or I really enjoy mechanical work and it's one of my hobbies. And oh, okay, you just show some interest. You don't have to know anything about their subject, but just show true, genuine empathy. I care about you. I care about what you're doing. I care about who's in your family, what's on your mind, just like I care about myself. And that develops trust. The next thing is authenticity, being true to who you are. For example, if it's your, your, it's your celebration, it could be Eid, right? And you take in a box of chocolates be, uh, for the nurses. And they're like, oh, what's the occasion? You say, I'm, I'm celebrating my um, special festival. It's called Eid. And they're like, oh, that's so nice. Thank you for you know thinking of us and sharing your celebration with us. So this is the authenticity, just being a real person and, and people connect with that. And finally, logic. When people know that they can depend on you, that you will do your job and you will do your clinical work in a way that's consistent, that where they can predict what your actions will be because you are constant, because you work according to the guidelines and you don't do anything outside of the guidelines, that is logical work that increases your credibility and it increases your trust. But you need all three ingredients in order to develop that trust. So shall we go into the next slide? So we've covered culture and the trust triangle. And next we're going to talk about non-clinical skills. So if we can move on. Thank you. So how, uh, when I said non-clinical skills, the most important thing to understand is how do you grow the skills that you've got? How do you maintain the skills that you learn? So there's five aspects to this. Each picture re represents one step. Step one, organize your time and your resources. Number two, actively listen active listening. We're going to talk about what does that mean? Okay. Number three, this picture with the three hands is about collaborating. And then number four is looking every situation can present an opportunity and you have to become a professional at recognizing the opportunities that arise in different situations. And then finally, it's personal development. Um, it's it's developing those. So let's go on to the next slide. It's the first one. Step one is time management, personal organization. That's how you, you learn to um, grow your skills. So plan and prioritize your work so that you can complete them easily and quickly. A well-organized person will be able to meet deadlines and collaborate effectively with others. Now, the important points here are, this is all like, yeah, okay, that's obvious. I know that. But do you actually do it? It's like the person who says, I need to lose weight. Yeah, I know I need to lose weight. But what are you actually doing to lose weight? So in this situation, organizing your time, you know that if you get up early 
and you make it in your mind, you already know what are the most important things I must do today. There's the essential things that must be done. And then there's the optional things that if they get done, that's good. Then there's the other things that are just taking up your time. Would you do them? Or if you don't do them, it won't make any difference. And a lot of us have a lot of those things that's just cluttering our limited amount of time. Get rid of those straight away. So what are your personal boundaries? Do you just sit and like doom scroll on your phone and then end up going to bed late and then you wake up and then you're really tired in the morning? You're not feeling refreshed. You don't feel like going to work. You're not going to work in a positive uh, frame of mind. Um, what about fear of missing out, FOMO? So when somebody says to you, oh, would you like to do this project? You keep taking on more and more projects because you don't want to miss out, but you're not organizing your time because if you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else and you need to choose what you spend your time and how, how you give your attention. You need to choose carefully because you're paying with your life. You're paying with your career. You've only got a finite amount of time. You can't take everything on. So identify what your goals are and only take the projects that will get you to the goal that you want for you. So do an inventory of what you say yes to, what you said no to, and what you're saying maybe to, okay? So just check things that you've said yes to. Is that going to get you closer to where you want to be? No is a full sentence. You know, if something doesn't fit, you say no, but you say it politely because people will remember how you interact with them and how you make them feel. Say, I think there might be somebody who's got more experience that can do this if you definitely don't want to do it. Um, okay, let's move on to the next slide, please. Step two. Step two was the picture of the ear. Be an active listener. This is so crucial to um, collaborating with team members and work colleagues. What does active listening mean? If we were together in one of my virtual workshops, we would have done um, an exercise where you listen to the person, you work in pairs and they speak to you about what's happening in their life at the moment or in their job at the moment. And you really listen with the aim of asking a thoughtful question so you're not thinking about something else when they're speaking. You're not waiting for them to stop so that you can start talking. You're actually focusing on what they are saying. So paying attention is an essential part of good communication. Do you remember in last week's webinar, part two, we talked about communication and how lack of poor communication skills is one of the most common causes of patient complaints and colleague inter-conflict work, uh, inter, inter conflict in work is the word I'm, I'm looking for. So to learn or improve on a skill, you must focus on what others are saying and feeling. You must also share your ideas. A good communicator will speak clearly and confidently with a positive tone appropriate for the situation. So I'm going to give you a small story to explain this point better. I had a coachee who was um, a doctor and this coachee said as well that I feel like when other people speak, people stop and they listen. And when I speak, I'm just saying things and nobody's really listening to me. So it doesn't make me feel good. So we talked about how do you speak? What are you going to say? What is your tone? Do you speak with confidence have a think about what you're going to say before you say it so that it's succinct and to the point and you're saying it because you believe it when you say things with conviction people will listen so she went away and she practiced that and came back and the, she was like yes yes it works <laughs> so start with listening to ask your the person you're speaking to a thoughtful question that makes them feel oh they really listened and there are some other techniques you can use like summarizing back to them oh okay you explain this to me now can I just check my understanding um, and please let me know if I missed anything out you what I heard you say was the pain was chronic that I became red six weeks ago and then two weeks later, you started getting flashes and floaters. Is that right? And the patient will feel, 
oh, this doctor really, really understood me and really took the time to listen to me. All you've done is you've reflected back to them in their own words what they said to you. But it's so powerful. Okay, next slide, please. Step number three, collaborate with others. So learning through discussion groups and from your network can be an effective way to reflect and enhance your knowledge and professional expertise. I sent Dr. List of the top five podcasts for ophthalmology trainees, and there's some really good ones on that. Get involved. And also, um, I, I told you in, in the last webinar that Dr. Adnan and I came across each other through the British Pakistani Ophthalmological Society event that I was chairing. And what did Dr. Adnan do? He collaborated with me. He, he kept my email and he emailed me. And at that time, I was moving to America. This was 14 months ago. And I said, oh, Dr. Adnan, I really want to help. I really want to be part of this because I admired his passion for helping his colleagues and supporting his colleagues in ophthalmology education. And I said, I really want to help, but right now I'm moving to a different country, to a different continent. So I'm just a bit busy, but don't forget, and inshallah, we will, um, you know, we will try again in the future when I've got a bit more time. And what did Dr. Adnan do? He didn't let it go, you know, six months later. He, it was Eid and he sent me an Eid message. And then I said, oh yeah, I, I really need to do that work I said I was gonna do for with BPOS and Dr. Adnan. And so here we are, collaborate with others, um, get involved, uh, any, any forums that you can think of, get be actively present, contribute, submit a case presentation. So if we have the next uh, slide, please. This follows on from the example that I just gave you which is consider every situation an opportunity. So be a professional opportunist. When you are dealing with a problem, assess your options and determine the best solution. Research different scenarios that you come across and seek advice when necessary. It's so important to think things through step by step. You know, what you wanna do, what are your options to get there? You brainstorm like there's no limit. There's no limit on time. There's no limit on money. There's no there's no red tape. There's no immigration rules. You just think what what it is you want to do, and then you break it down into small steps. Okay, what's realistic? What can I achieve? What's within my gift? And then you break it down into small steps. So seek advice when necessary. People who can think seriously and work through complex problems are more likely to make good decisions both in life and in work. And that speaks to that logic bit. If that's the kind of person you are, people will see that in you, that you have a logical approach and that builds trust. So that's very important. Step five, please, if we go to the next slide. Step five is constantly improve and develop yourself. So I had a coachee who was really angry and really upset. And he was asked that he had to repeat a year because he didn't meet the expectations for training for that year. And he said to me, I feel so angry because I know that I'm really good. I'm better than my colleagues. I can manage emergencies without asking my seniors. And my some of my colleagues can't do that. And they're moving forward and I'm being asked to help back. And he was so angry. And he gave me a list of nine things that he was angry with the you know uh, seniors about. So I said, okay, what did you do in the last six months to invest in your personal development? And, and he just looked at me, nothing. So constantly improve and develop yourself. Don't be one of those people that just complains about everybody else. Um, you know, think about yourself, like stay motivated to learn from your mistakes and your failures. Listen to people when they give you feedback. Don't start by saying, yes, but, but it was this and it was that. And my grandma was sick and my mom was upset. And, and then I had to do this. And that is not my fault. You know, we all do that. It's natural. We talked about how to give and receive feedback in one of the previous webinars and the three stages that we go through. Get to the productive stage as quickly as possible where your brain is open to receiving the feedback. So don't give up. Identify your weaknesses and turn those into your strengths. 
take advantage of technology to enhance your skills. So constantly improve and develop yourself. That's the fifth step. Okay, let's um, go to the next slide. I think we're coming to the end now. So what have we covered today? We've talked about why culture is important and understanding different cultures. And when I came to Pakistan, I was a medical student. Uh, this was one of the trips I had in the past. And you know what I did? I want to tell you about this culture. So I, I'm brought up in, in the UK, right? But my parents came from Pakistan. And I came to Pakistan for my medical school elective when I was fourth year medical school from Liverpool University. And I was with a group of medical students from, I was in PIMS, Pakistan Institute of Medical Sciences in Islamabad. And I'll never forget this because I didn't mean to upset this other medical student. So they, the, the, they took me for lunch. They said, oh, you're a, you know, you're a guest and you're from England and you're a medical student and we'd like to take you for lunch. And I said, oh, that's so kind. Thank you. I, I'd like to go. We went to the hospital canteen and we got lunch. And then I was paying for my own lunch. And you know, the, the girl, she looked at me, the other medical student, she said, she said, we don't, we, we don't uh, let our guests pay. And you know, she got really upset that I was trying to be so formal and that I wasn't accepting her hospitality. But I didn't mean it like that because in, in the UK, everybody pays for themselves. We all split it. And we don't have this culture of, so, so beautiful culture of, exquisite hospitality like we do in Pakistan. So that was just an example of understanding different culture because by accident, you might just make somebody feel like you're not, you know, you're not accepting their hospitality. And then what happens? They feel distant from you. And then that affects your teamwork and it affects your collaboration just because we're all human. Okay, so when I realized I offended her, I said, sorry, but I still remember it to this day because she meant so much kindness. Yeah. Okay, thank you uh, for your attention. I think that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Are there any questions or comments? If not, we can we can maybe listen to Dr. Adnan's um, reflection and maybe we can invite Ajaz uh, Sheikh from BPOS to say a few words to conclude our series of three webinars. Well, in the UK, they, they will have an application form that will be on, uh, on online and you will have to take information from your portfolio and put it into the um, online application form. So they won't ask you to send, they don't, they've stopped doing that where in the past they used to say, send us a copy of your CV. And then, you know, in the in olden days, it used to be paper and the person shortlisting would read through all the CVs and put one in a pile of shortlist for interview and one in a pile for no, no interview. That stop, everything is paperless now. So if they do, even very rarely they ask for a CV now, what they do is they ask structured questions like give us an example of teamwork. Give us an example of uh, your understanding of clinical governance. When, show, tell us of a time when you um, were actively involved in clinical governance and you're expected to write a few paragraphs but you will use your portfolio for inspiration and examples to fill in those questions. So oh, how you much. keep your portfolio, you can keep it how you choose to keep it. If you keep it um, on electronically, maybe you can cut and paste, but I would also say don't do that because the question will be worded in a specific way and you've got to answer the question that they're asking you. Thank you. So if you. Yeah, yeah. So you can keep it in paper form if you want, or on your computer by uploading PDFs or take you okay. know scanning things, and then you've got an electronic version if you want to be paperless. Generally speaking, um, I personally use Google Docs so that if I access a computer anywhere, all my documents are there. I don't have to carry things around with me. So Google Docs has changed my life. Yeah. <laughs> sort of management experience um, would they be expecting to see from a trainee ophthalmologist or from a, somebody who hasn't you know, got a formal management role? That's a really good question. 
things like if you were involved with uh, helping with a conference um, in your hospital, for example, you know, I, I have management experience of um, whatever the specific role was that you did to help organize this icon uh, in this hospital. And I collaborated with colleagues to design the agenda. And then I wrote emails to you know, invite speakers. And then I was on the front desk to register the attendees. And, you know, the, so that's one thing. There's lots of management experience around being involved in an eye conference. The other thing is uh, recruiting patients for uh, clinical trials or for any sort of a grand round situation. That's, that's management work there because you're having to look through. So initially you said to me you were interested mm. in audit. And yet I just that's wanted not. to highlight the difference between audits and portfolios. Because you said, I really, I really like the concept of an audit where I look at what the gold standard is and is my practice achieving, am I doing what I should be doing according to this published guidance? Um, and then you audit to see what your results are and then you make an action plan to say, I am achieving doing what I'm doing or I'm not achieving the results. Therefore, what do I need to change? And then you re-audit and then you keep that evidence and it shows that when somebody asks you as a doctor, how do you know that you're a good doctor? And then you can say, well, I audit my results. This is what I do. Here is an example. I looked at the rate of macular hole closure after macular hole repair surgery and compared to this published guidance, my rate of closure is comparable or I found that my rate of closure was not as good. And therefore, I looked at my practice and I started encouraging my patients to posture for longer. You know, this is just an example. I don't think people posture anymore, but because <laughs> of the gas that they use and things. But um, so that's audit. But portfolio, your audit would go into your portfolio. It's one of the chapters, but there's so many other chapters. Okay. to show evidence of other skills. So not audit is just one skill. Research is another skill. Then uh, surgical skills, then case-based discussions, uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for clearing. Thank you so much, everybody. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you.